In this video, we'll be talking about the HTV visa application process and the 9142B and some of the common pitfalls. You kind of like ended that suddenly. Yeah. Some of the common pitfalls. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna. No, let's just go with it. We'll see you after the break. Sure. Great. This is the channel where we give you reliable information, help you make better decisions, and avoid costly mistakes on your immigration journey. We pay special attention to the H2B program because that is something that Trent Williams and I work on quite a bit, H2B visas. And so in this series, which is our 2021-2022 H2B series, we've been giving you tips on what you need to be looking for in this historic H2B cycle, which is going to be the biggest one ever and where timing is more important than ever, and where avoiding pitfalls is more important than ever. And we say that from experience, having experienced many successes, but also many pitfalls of this process. 9142B and its pitfalls. This is the topic. Trent, are you worried this year? <laughs> I'm always worried, but I'm also cautiously optimistic. Why are you cautiously optimistic? Because we've done this. And what I'm going to talk about today is 9142B and some of the pitfalls that are common and ways to avoid those pitfalls. Ways to put your application forward knowing that you've done the best you can do to avoid the pitfalls that, I mean, they happen to a lot of companies every year. Give me a 10 second summary of what the 9142B is. The 9142B is your opportunity to show the Department of Labor why you need workers to show them that you have a temporary need, that that temporary need is seasonal, peak load, intermittent, or one time, and to show the exact number of workers you need. I like that you phrased it as an opportunity, okay? So we have pitfalls. And by the way, we're using an awesome blog post that uh, Trent wrote uh, that we've linked to in the uh, description here, where you can reference a lot of the pitfalls that we're talking about here. Pitfall one here. Inconsistent information. You know, you say, what, what, what is inconsistent information? What is that? Yeah, so your 9142B is filed through FLAG. Yes. And if you have been working with this, you know that FLAG is where you filed your 9141, mm. your prevailing wage determination. When you start your 9142B, you're allowed to click that you are using that prevailing wage determination and some of the information autofills. Mm. If you're paranoid like me, you double check it because you want to make sure that that information is accurate. It's possible that you missed one number in your zip code on your 9141, that auto-populated to your 9142, that now looks different than your job order address, and you're gonna get a notice of deficiency because of it. So, you know, even though you'd like to think that everything's transferring over accurately, double check it. Uh, the big one is EIN. EIN is so easy to mess up because it's just number, number, dash, number, 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 number. And if your EIN is off on your prevailing wage, it's going to be off on your 9142B, at which point you have to redo your prevailing wage. I actually have to do that. It's a pain. Okay. The other inconsistency is, you know, at the same time that you're filing your 9142B, you're also filing a job order with it, you know, right. that you put through with right. SWA. That also has to have consistent information with your 9142B. Exactly. So it's three documents that kind of, they have to be consistent all the way through or they will get a notice um, of deficiency. And that can be as simple as, you know, stating that your company is Frontera Tech Law Incorporated. LLC. And then in your- No big deal, it's an LLC. Well, but in another document you could say- Oh, Frontera, it's incorporated. Frontera Tech oh, so Law it LLC. Yeah. So that's a very small thing. Yeah. You know, maybe it wouldn't trigger a notice of deficiency. But it will. But we've seen that happen. It will. 100%. So, They're actually very meticulous. They are. That stuff. That's what they, they, are. they have checked. Okay. So that's so that's a pitfall number one. Again, a little extra work. Make sure it's accurate and correct. Pitfall number two. Outdated documents. Outdated documents. So maybe you've done the H2B visa program before. You know that Appendix B has to be attached to this application. And you know, you you go through, you're like, oh, I have Appendix B, it's saved on my computer, I will just upload this. Appendix B is a timed document. It cannot be carried over from year to year. Similarly, 
your G28, if you're an attorney, is updated periodically. And if you submit one that is outdated, that could trigger a notice of deficiency. So always check to make sure you have the most recent version of these documents and that you're not just reusing documents from prior years. That makes sense to me. What's improper wage? You have that listed as the next one. What's <laughs> well, so when you filed your prevailing wage, if you had multiple work sites, you probably received multiple prevailing wages. Mm. One for mm. you know your headquarters, your work site one, another for work site two, and so forth. So on the wage on your 9142B, it has to be the highest of all of those. So it's not necessarily your prevailing wage determination. It is the highest prevailing wage for any of the work sites you are submitting into this application. That makes sense. All right, moving right along. Failure to provide sufficient evidence, part one. Yeah, so that's a big one. Um, part one addresses the number of workers you have asked for. Maybe you asked for 10 workers, but you didn't supply enough evidence to support the need for 10 workers. How do you show evidence for workers? Payroll, revenue, By the way, I know, these, I know these answers. I don't want you to think I'm like, well, how does that happen? But uh, I'm asking I the think questions they know. for I, you. I think they know that you know. They may not. You are a very good actor, so. I, I am, I am, I do skits. But, yeah, moving, right. moving Mo forward. Moving, along. Yeah. moving forward. Yeah. So you've asked for your number of workers. You may need to supply, you know, payroll records, um, work schedules, all of the contracts you have for the coming cycle, you know, just things of that nature that help explain what you're gonna do with 10 workers once they get here. How are you going to distribute them across your operation? Why do you need 10 workers? Will that reduce your overtime hours for your permanent workers? You know, you have to explain that and really get into detail as to why 10 would be the proper number. So what's failure of evidence part two? Part two would be a failure to show maybe that your need is temporary. Mm -hmm. So the HCB program that, is- That's the big one for smaller employers. So it's not, it's not meant to be a year long program. It's not meant for employers who have a, you know, a, a 365 need. It's meant for employers who have a seasonal need, a peak load need. And it's so typical. I mean, I think the number one thing that always comes up when I'm talking to potential H2B visa employers is that they go, I just need workers year round. And especially now in these COVID times where we have this labor crisis, it's like, I just can't find anyone to work. Like, I need them now, I need them tomorrow. And it's like, well, we gotta slow down. If you tell you know, the Department of Labor you need workers all the time, you're going to get this big notice of deficiency. You have to find a reason why you have a peak load need, a seasonal need, intermittent need, or one-time need. Right. right, and it may not even be that you need workers 365. It may just be that you didn't supply enough contracts, enough revenue um, trends to say that you need workers from April until January. I'll give you a great example. So uh, cleaning companies, right? So smaller cleaning companies that clean, let's say residential homes, most companies aren't even aware that they actually do have a peak load season. If you think about when residential cleaning companies have a peak load season, just think about it a little bit in terms of like when the housing market is, is hottest, you'll get a pretty clear idea. It actually happens to be spring, summer, because in the spring, when new residential homes are going up for sale, and old renters are moving out and new renters are coming in, companies that clean residential uh, places have a lot more business because they're regularly cleaning houses that need to be shown during open house events and they're cleaning apartments as old renters move out and new renters move in. And so often I bump into this where that particular type of business person actually isn't aware that actually that is your peak load time. Or, you know? or maybe, they are aware and they describe it just like that in their statement of need. Yes. But they don't attach revenue statements to back that up. They have them, but you don't realize, oh, I need to go above just telling you this is my logical need and prove it. So that's a common pitfall is that you might leave out some of that evidence that you do in fact have, but just don't realize should be included at this stage. Right. And if you're a smaller employer, often you don't have the best accounting practices, right? Um, and so it's necessary to actually go dig and, and re you know, basically reconstruct some of your financial records to show that. You know, and it's, it's something you need to know going into it that it might take a little extra time to do. Okay. Exactly. Any other pitfalls? 
You've got my list. What do we got? There, there are always more pitfalls. I think I have one particular pitfall that just based on experience, um, H2B does have classic categories, right? Especially seasonal H2B. So we got your landscapers, you have your fish manufacturers, you have your forestry workers, uh, you're gonna have your hospitality workers, you're gonna have your carnival workers. Um, and there's some other ones that are mid-sized, but then there's smaller categories that you can always try to fit in. Often they try to go into a one-time occurrence. We deal with a lot of these, which are nannies, um, you know, health aid workers of a certain type. Um, they're going to be very specialized occupations. You have to know that you're gonna to have to prove a lot more for those going in than for other ones, simply because officers haven't seen it. If officers get a landscape, so DOL, Department of Labor Officer, uh, somebody certifying the officer, a CO, if they see a landscape application, right, they know what they're looking for. And they know that landscapers, right, just it's kind of self-evident, are going to have a seasonal need, right, for workers. They're not going to be aware of that, you know, if you're applying for something like a nanny, right? So just know that one of the downfalls of getting something a little more specific is that it takes more time. I will never forget. It was in 2019, we had that um, client from Britain, he was an American, wanted to bring the British nanny into the US and it was denied on the most ridiculous reason that the nanny, that he had prior, previously employed a nanny. He said, but he employed her in the UK and the law deals with previously employing them in the US. And the certifying officer, long story short, was so confused. Oh, but, and, and he had never employed her for the company that was trying to employ her. No. Now, it was just like a personal connection between the two that was deemed pre-existing employment. It was crazy, but the moral of the story was... Don't confuse the officer, or realize exactly. the officer's the, gonna be confused. Right? The less your application looks like what they typically see, the more likely you are to get a notice of deficiency. You can reduce that risk by really putting together a strong evidence packet on the front end. There's still the chance. You may still get the notice of deficiency. You may get the denial, but take every step you can early to build the strongest application possible. So there's one more pitfall. There is one more pitfall. So in every single statement of need, we always say the employer has recruited diligently and is unable to find workers. We say it every time. And without fail, if there is a notice of deficiency, it's always noted that a labor shortage is not enough. Every time. So everything we just discussed as far as showing the number of workers you need, showing that it's a seasonal peak load, etc., that's great because a shortage of labor is not enough. Even in 2021, 2022, you know, prime labor crisis, it's still not enough. Now, you won't get a notice of deficiency if you show that you need a certain number of workers and you know you have a strong evidence packet for why you need those workers and why it's tied to one of the specific categories but don't just rely on a labor shortage because that will always come up short that's it there are other ways that an application can uh, go downhill 9142b but for now that's what you need to keep in mind for 2021 2022 if you have questions leave them in the comments if you want to contact us our numbers are in the description. They've probably been all over the screen because Santiago, our video editor, is amazing. Um, there's a playlist. Check it out here. Santiago's putting in. There's a playlist where we do a whole bunch of these H2B videos. There's more coming up this week. So subscribe, like. This is... Sorry, I thought you were going to point to something <laughs> no, no. for them to see. This is a nice lady. <laughs> she's, this, she's lovely. This is... Trent Williams, and also I... known as H2B Lawyer. Ah. Ah, check me out on Twitter. And this is Damien, De what's your Twitter handle? H2B Lawyer. Santiago, run that <laughs> under. And my name is Damien DeNoble of Law Great. We'll see you next time.